Okay, in the second part we start off with a number of basic text styling things um, just to give you an impression what else you can do apart from colors but you can just look in any of the references I've given you for tutorials for lots and lots of examples of what you can do with, with CSS. Um, here are just a number of different properties that you can declare that help you to style text. Uh, and they're all fairly straightforward. So you have text minus align. That simply gives you the alignment. Is the text centered, left, right, or justified? Uh, the indent is how is the first line of a paragraph or of a block indented? Uh, so for example, if you declare it with 10 pixels, then there is a 10 pixel indentation. Uh, I can show you that. Font family is essentially what you use to declare what kind of font to use. Um, so by default, the browser uses the standard font that it has, um, but you can declare this. And there is quite a complex way of doing that. You can basically start saying, I want a very specific font, you give the name, and then you can give fallback. You can say that, okay, if this font does not exist, then use the family of Helvetica fonts or things like that. Uh, the best way to learn that is to actually look up in a reference because it doesn't make sense to list all of them. Then you can have a font style. So it can be normal, it can be italic, it can be oblique. Uh, so different ways of styling your font. And you have a font size, of course. The different sizing units, we'll go into them in a second. Uh, and finally, you can have the weight. Is it regular, normal font or is it bold faced font? Um, so that's uh, all you can do there. And we can just look at an example I've made here. So you see that is all inline styles and I've basically just done a couple of things. I have uh, centered and right aligned text. I have indented a paragraph. So you'll see that there, there is a slight break at the beginning. Here I use a specific uh, font and this is essentially the fallback I've mentioned. I say that I want this font. If it doesn't exist, use this font family. If that doesn't exist, use monospace, which is sort of a general, uh, general type. Then I have some italic. Uh, and finally, I have the weight, bold font with a size three. Here you also see that uh, even in inline uh, CSS, I can of course have multiple declarations. So you just have the uh, colon and the space, and that's how you combine different things. Uh, if you look at this, it gives you exactly what I want to do. Uh, so not, no surprise until the center text. So then this is centered as I wanted to. Here we have it right aligned. Here you have a paragraph with a certain indent. And you see this if I make my uh, window smaller so that it wraps around, you'll see that it's only the first line that has this indent. Um, here I've changed the font to this Corea new type. Uh, I have italic text and finally I have bold text, which I've also changed the size of. Uh, so that's just a number of things you can do uh, for text. Now you've seen the length units. I've written here pixel EM. Here I've written pixel EM, REM percent. Those are different units for defining size or space. Uh, and the important thing is that there are absolute and relative sizes. So pixel is an absolute size. It's always 16 pixel if I declare that. Um, and this is really bad for accessibility because uh, it's 16 pixel no matter whether you have a, I don't know, a 60 inch screen or a tiny smartphone, it's always 16 pixel. Or if you have a very high density screen on phones, it's again only 16 pixels. So it means that sometimes uh, the things should differ. For example, if the user says in the browser, I would like to have a larger font size than usual, then maybe 16 pixel is not a good choice. Or if you have a phone with a very high density resolution, you maybe should use 32 instead of 16. Uh, so that's a bit problematic. What you can do instead is use relative sizes. Um, and for example, EM, let's start with that, is simply the unit of the base font size. So if the user sets the default font size to 16 pixel, then one EM is exactly 16 pixel. Um, but if the user changes it to 32 because he or she can read uh, not so well, 
then suddenly 1EM is 32 pixel. So it basically means you adapt that to the user uh, and it changes. Also, if, uh, for example, the browser setting on a phone is different, then automatically this changes. Uh, this is very good. The problem is uh, EM refers to the font size that is uh, the parent element. So if you change the font size in your parent element, uh, then basically you get nesting problems. And I believe I can show this here, but there is an issue to that. So for example, here I use 2EM. So let's say my base font size is 16 pixels, then I should get 32 here. Um, here I do 2EM again and I want to have 30, uh, 32 pixels. The problem is it basically takes twice of what I have here. So instead of 32, I get 64 here. Uh, so basically EM always refers to the parent element. Uh, and if somehow the, the font size of the parent element has changed, then it changes here as well. So it adds up in this case, meaning this is the regular font size. This is exactly double the size and this will be four times the size if we look at that. So you see that this you can imagine is roughly double this. And obviously this is much, much larger. So even though I've used the same unit here, the result is very different. Uh, to avoid that, you can use REM, uh, which is relative EM. And that's exactly what we want. That's always referring to the parent, uh, to, the, to the absolute size. So no matter where you use it in your nesting, it's still two times the standard font size. Uh, and in this case, you will notice I have the P tag in the same hierarchy as the, the other one. Still, it is just double the size. So it's exactly what I would like to have. It's the root EM. Um, so this is very good for, for relative sizes. And you should, for accessibility reasons, you should avoid pixel and use relative sizes instead. Now you have seen colors and you actually have seen two different ways of setting the color. Uh, you have seen the preset color names. So I've used red, I've used tomato, I've used blue, and there are a number of really bizarre names. Uh, if you're interested in why, here is a link on, on the history of why we have those weird names. Um, but there are also three more standard ways of defining the, the color. So yeah, I have used the hex value already in some of the examples. Um, you can also set it via RGB or HSL. So those are standard uh, ways in computers to send color. This is just red, green, blue from zero to 255. This is hue, saturation, lightness. Um, which is percentage and I believe a value between zero and hundred, but not sure. Uh, and hex is just hexadecimal. So you again have two digits for red, two digits for green, two digits for blue. Um, so these are the standard things you typically see. These color names are not often used. Um, and you have seen that I used the background color. You can also just set the foreground, the text color. Uh, so instead of using background color as a property, you use color. Uh, again, there are enough examples in here. Uh, so I'm setting the color I'm in different ways um, instead of the background color. So that's not very exciting, but of course it's a super important thing that is used uh, very widely. Okay, um, so, so much for colors and sort of basic tags. Um, I've basically shown you how to define CSS inline, internally, externally. So these three different combinations and uh, how to combine them. I've shown you how to define properties for so-called selectors. Um, and you can do a bit of coloring and text layouting. The other thing that we have seen, and that's when it gets interesting now, is that we can do contradicting things. So we could say color all paragraphs red. And then we could say color all the elements with ID para one green. Uh, and then you'll see that here we have an element that is both a paragraph and has the ID para one. And of course, this is somehow a contradicting declaration. So the question now, is it red or is it green? Or is it maybe something else? Uh, and that's what we look at next. And this is where the cascading comes from. So the C in CSS. 
this basically means that there is a different order in how important different declarations are and which one wins in the end. Uh, and this is something that's important to understand. So as a very first part, you can define three, uh, you can define CSS at three different places. So not the declarations we have talked about so far, the inline, external and so on, but you can define it in, uh, in your computer in different ways. So you have the user agent, this is really the browser. So for example, if I have Firefox, then Firefox has a number of settings. Uh, for example, maybe the setting is that the standard font size is 12 pixel. Then you have the author of a website. So if you are writing HTML and CSS code, you can, just as we have done so far, you can use inline, internal, external definitions to define the style. And finally, you have the user, and that's the end user that is going to your website. That person might also be overriding, might have their own CSS settings. For example, you might have a special tool for accessibility that makes everything larger. Um, so this order is exactly top down. Uh, if the user, the end user defines something, it's the most important thing. Uh, so if you as a website designer say the font size is 16 pixel, but the end user says it's 32, then it will be 32. So this one is more important than the author. Uh, and the author, if you develop a website, is more important than the default, the browser default. Uh, so that's the general order. Um, and then we have another thing that we can add. Every CSS declaration can have an importance. Uh, and that's if you add this exclamation mark important. Uh, and basically this means that, okay, this declaration here is especially important. Um, those are number of things. We'll go into which one counts when. Uh, and then finally, we have a so-called specificity. Uh, so a selector is more or less specific. And there are again some rules for that, but as an intuition, uh, you could say that here we assign something to an ID. That's a unique element. So somehow this is much more specific than saying all paragraphs. Uh, so in the example I just gave you before, the ID selector is actually the one that wins because it's much more specific. But we'll get into details now. So, um, the general order of, independent, uh, of importance is like this. First, the least important thing is the user agent. So whatever you have in your browser, um, then it's the user. So if you as a, uh, as a user on your computer, you define, I want to have 32 pixels, uh, that's more important than the default. Then the website uh, developer defines his or her CSS. Uh, and that changes everything. Then the website designer could add the important flag. Uh, and that's then more important than the things that don't have an important flag. Uh, and finally, the end user has the final say. If he or she adds a slash uh, exclamation mark important, it overrides everything else. Uh, so that's what I meant on the page before when I said in the end, the user can choose their own font size, for example. Uh, so this is the order, how it works, which means that as a designer of the website, you can never be sure that it actually looks exactly as you want in the end, because the user can override everything. Now, um, at any of these points, you can have uh, things that are somehow contradicting. So for example, the one we look at now is the author. If we write our own CSS, our own inline definition, then we can have contradicting things, as for example, in, in this example here, we have a declaration with two overlapping uh, properties. And then the more important one is the one that has a higher specificity. Um, and there are a number of rules for this, and we'll go into that now into some uh, detail. First of all, you ha we have the three different ways of declaring. We can do inline, we can do internal, and we can do external. The inline style has the highest specificity. So it's always the one that wins. Um, 
The ID selectors have a higher specificity than a class selectors. So uh, ID is one single unique element and class is more of a group. So ID is more important. And class selectors are more specific than tag selectors. Um, so a group of elements is still more specific than saying all paragraphs, for example. Uh, and finally, you might have uh, you might even have declarations that have exactly the same specificity, then it's simply the last one, the, the last one in your code that wins. So let's look at that, uh, because this is an important and, and rather difficult concept. Uh, but here we have some HTML, uh, HTML and CSS code. So you see that here we have inline and internal declarations to H1 uh, rule sets. One says color is blue, color is red. One class uh, selector, color is black. And then we have an inline one here as well. And now the first interesting one is this one here. It's the same origin. So both of it is an internal uh, declaration of the author and we have the same specificity. So H1 is a tag selector. This is also a tag selector. So they are kind of contradicting. And then as we said, the later one wins. So the color will be red because it basically overrides the previous definition. So that's the first thing. The next one, here we have a contradicting thing because H1 could either be red or it could be black. Uh, and in this case, the class is more specific than the tag, which means this declaration here wins, so the color is black. And finally, we have a paragraph H1, so the color should be red, but we also have this inline declaration. Uh, and as discussed, the inline one is more specific than the internal declaration here, so this one wins. So in this case, we will have a green text color. Um, and the inline one is also more specific than the class. So it doesn't matter here whether it's H1 or class. It simply means that inline is more important than this internal definition. So these things are rather complicated and it will probably take you some time to, to understand them. And in particular, this, this order here is very tricky. So I do not uh, expect that you know this perfectly by heart, but you should have some kind of intuition. Similar specificity you can actually calculate. So there are number values on that and it's actually more complicated than we have discussed here. So there, there is more detail to it, um, but we don't go into that depth here. If you want to, you can look it up in the references. Okay, now we have looked at the selector so far and we have seen the tag selectors, the class and the ID selectors, but they can actually be a bit more complicated. Uh, and that's what are so-called combinators. Um, so a combinator is uh, basically a combination of different selectors and then things are uh, meaning are applied to different elements. So we have three different ones here and they are uh, yeah, different order. The first one is the simplest. It's simply a list of different selectors. So in this case, font size 2 REM is assigned to every element that is in uh, that has ID EL1 or that has ID EL2. And you could add, as it says up here, it's only examples. This can be any selector. So you could do comma P, comma table or whatever. So it's just a list of things. Uh, so that's the most straightforward one. It's simply to reuse the same thing for more than one selector. The next one is a so-called child combinator. In this case, I say that the element uh, EL2, ID EL2, that is a child of EL1 should have font size 2 REM. Uh, so only if in my HTML tree there is an element that has ID EL1 and that one has a direct child, a direct nested tag with ID EL2, that one will get this combinator, uh, this font size. There is a very similar one. If you have a space, it simply means it doesn't have to be a direct child. It could be further down in the nesting. Um, 
we can look at that. Oh yeah, right, I have visualizations to that. So the direct one here basically means uh, I have an element with ID EL2 and under there, there's something with EL2. Uh, that one then gets the font size and everything else that is here, doesn't matter. Uh, similarly for the descendant, there could be EL1. There's anything under it. And then further down in the hierarchy somewhere, there's something that's called EL2. That one then gets the font size to REM. Um, so these are more complicated combinators. Uh, I have them all here. So you'll see that here is the direct child one. Here is the descendant one. Here is again the direct child one. And here is another one we'll get to in a second. Um, but you can look at the details and figure out how this works. So for example, if we have a P tag, a paragraph that is directly under a B tag, then it should be yellow. Uh, and if we look at that, maybe we have it somewhere here, we have a B tag and it includes a P tag. So this one should be, uh, should be yellow. Here it says red. Um, we have to change that. Here, the situation is slightly different because we have a B. In between, there's a different tag and then the P tag. So this is a descendant. So this one should be red, I believe, unless I have mixed them up. Yeah, you see, I've mixed up the color. This one should be yellow and this one should be red. So it's exactly the other way around. But you can look at the code in detail to figure this out. Now you have already seen maybe in the code that there was something else and those are the siblings. Um, there are two different ones. There's the plus and the tilde combinator. Um, and the plus means we have a direct neighbor. So we have an element with ID EL1 and we have an element with EL2 and they have the same parent element. Um, so that means they will have, or EL2 will have font size 2 REM. Uh, then there's the more general one, that's the tilde. Uh, and that means that there can be stuff in between. So here, EL2 has to come directly after EL1. Here, there could be something else in between. Uh, so that's a general sibling. Again, if we look at that in code, uh, you could see that we have the case here, div p. Um, here, for example, we have a div. And on the same hierarchy level, we have a B, a B and a P. And the P tag here is a sibling. So it's on this, it, they have, both have the same parent element. Diff has a body as a parent and P has also the body. Uh, so this would be affected by the tilde. Uh, it should have background color teal. Uh, so that's exactly what we have here. If we would use the plus, Instead, the direct sibling, it would not work because there are two other elements in between. So it's not a direct sibling, a direct neighbor. So these are combinators. Um, and then we can change our selectors in even different ways. Uh, and there are two different things. One is called the so-called attribute selectors. Um, and that means you can basically specify in a bit more detail what exactly you want to target. So for example, here we have an A selector. So we want to target all A tags, all links, but only those that have attribute target equals blank. Uh, so basically only the links that open something in a new window will be affected by this style. Uh, or if we go into forms, for example, we can select all the input tags, all the input fields, but only the ones that are of type button. Uh, so this makes it possible to, to specify in a bit more detail which things we want to affect. Uh, and the input is actually a good example. If you think that the input tag has lots of different shapes, it can be a text field, it can be a button, it can be a radio button. Uh, so it makes sense to say, I only want to have the, the button that you can click, for instance. Um, so basically, these uh, square brackets mean that we select only the tags that have a specific attribute. Now, you can make this as complicated as you want to. You can look this up in four. For example, you can say, select all the links that have the attribute target set. So somehow target shows up in the tag and has a value, but we don't care what the value is. 
or you can say take all the attributes that have a class that starts with top so the tilde here indicates the class attribute should start with top uh, so lots and lots of ways to make this really complicated uh, I do have some in the in the eighth file here so you can look this up a little bit uh, in this case I only style <coughs> the hyperlink that has blank as a target that becomes pink and you'll see that I have two different links here I have a regular I uh, have a link that has target blank so this one should become pink and the other one should not become pink uh, and we'll quickly confirm that yeah you see the first link has a pink background color the second one doesn't now you can of course do all of this with classes as well you could assign classes to the different links that distinguish this but it's sometimes good to be able to do this uh, another thing is called a pseudo class so that basically describes the state of an element um, and the, the, shape, the form of that is that you have a selector as before for example you have a p then you have a cologne and then you add a pseudo class so that's something that describes the state there are again lots of possibilities check them out if you want to uh, but here we have a number of typical ones for example you know that hyperlinks links that you click on have different states so they can be just a regular link uh, but they have this hovering behavior. So sometimes they get a different color when you go over them. Sometimes they get a different color when you click on them. And sometimes they get a different color when you have uh, used them before, when you have visited them. Um, and that's exactly the pseudo states here. So the link is just the regular state. Visited it is if you have clicked on it. Hover if, if you go over it. And active is when I'm currently clicking. Uh, so that way you can assign, for example, different sizes, background colors, any kind of strange behavior that you like. And there are, as I said, lots of uh, elements that you can use. For example, you can select all the elements that are disabled. Uh, think about a form. I want to have all the input fields that are disabled right now, and they should be gray. Um, I want to select only the seventh child of a diff for example so if you have five or six paragraphs in there you can select a specific one of them um, and so on you can select form elements uh, that are invalid this is something we'll not discuss here but this is for example used to when you have to check what's in a form someone has to register for example and you want to check whether the password is valid then maybe you select all the fields that are invalid and add a light red background color or so. Uh, so those are pseudo classes. It's basically in what state the element is. Again, there is a, uh, a file on that. So we have the different link colors depending on their state. Uh, we select all the disabled elements of type input. Um, we select everything that is checked that applies, for example, to the checkbox in a form. Um, and we select everything that's invalid, which I believe we're not using here. Um, and if you look into the details, you'll see that this in fact works. For example, we have the link. The standard link has a background color black and is white text. If I hover over it, the background should ch uh, change to gray. You see that now it's gray and the, back and the regular text color is black. If I click on it, it gets background red and color white. So that seems to work. And finally, if I uh, have visited it, it changes to blue with a white background. I'm not sure that works here um, because I don't save that information. But if you would Remember that if you would revisit the site, this would have a blue background. Um, and for example, you see that the, the disabled element here has white background, red text. Uh, I don't know why this has red background. Let's check. That's probably this one because it has in, uh, invalid input. And I don't know why the input is invalid. We have probably yeah, it's an email field uh, and an email field 
in HTML requires an add. I don't know how smart this is. Yeah, so not very smart, but you see that it has some kind of checking on the syntax uh, and it changes if it's invalid. So there are some options we can do with these pseudo classes that can be quite useful. Uh, the last thing I'm bothering you with now is pseudo elements. Uh, they don't describe the state, but they instead select a part of an element. Uh, and they have this double colon instead of a single one. Uh, there are not that many options there, and I'm not honestly not quite sure how useful they are in practice, uh, but nevertheless. We cover two here only. If you have text elements, you can select, for example, the first line or the first letter. Uh, and this is something I have also in here. So you'll see that down here I have a single rule set where I select all the paragraphs and the first letter in all the paragraphs. And that one is much, much larger and bold. Uh, and if you have looked at the example, you see that this is the case here. So this letter here is much, much bolder and larger than the rest. Uh, and I've done that purely by CSS. So the paragraph does not have any special elements or anything like that. It's just a paragraph. So those are the pseudo elements. Uh, I can select part of an element, but as I said, there are not that many options and they're maybe not that useful. Okay, so that's it for the second part. Uh, you have learned a little bit how CSS definitions are counted. So you have this order of where are they defined in your browser or by the user or by the author. Uh, and more importantly, you have the specificity. So how specific is a selector for an element? Which one is more important? And then on top of that, we learned about a bit more advanced selectors. So how to combine different things. For example, the ancestors select a child of something else. And you have seen pseudo classes and pseudo elements. Pseudo classes are for the state. So they select elements that are in a specific state. Uh, pseudo elements select part of an element. So for example, the first letter of a paragraph. This is so good. We'll stop here for that. And the third part will look at the CSS box model, which is very important to understand how things are drawn in CSS.